Tonight, a silent threat sends dozens to hospital. Cases of carbon monoxide poisoning soar during a massive blackout. Running the risk to keep warm. Generators are meant to be used only outside, not in your home. As exasperation builds over lack of electricity. No furnace, no hot water. Yeah, pretty much done. Tensions high in Taiwan. China is determined to react every time they see Taiwan stepping out of line. As superpowers show a force against an island nation. Plus the amazing aim of Anna Kim. She's gonna do not just us proud, but she'll do Canada proud. The legally blind archer with a shot at the international stage. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. Four days after a powerful ice storm left more than a million in Quebec and Ontario powerless, hundreds of thousands of households are still in the dark, and that has led to a troubling side effect, a spike in hospital admissions from carbon monoxide poisoning as people look for ways to stay warm and prepare meals. Since the storm hit, more than 100 residents in Montreal and Laval have been treated for poisoning, more than 82 of them hospitalized. In Ottawa, 11 members of the same family spent time in hospital. It has prompted an urgent warning to stop using barbecues or generators indoors. CTV's Jackie Perez reports. I did it too close to the edge. <laughs> Sasha Force and her family have been sitting in the dark for the last three days, piling on the blankets as they wait for the lights to come on. No furnace, no hot water. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much done. Wednesday's icy storm left hundreds of thousands of people across eastern Ontario and Quebec with no power or heat. Because it's kind of been colder. Like every night, it's a little bit colder, a little bit less of the residual heat or more of the residual heat's gone. We've, we've had a friend offer us their place if uh, we need somewhere to go tonight. Hydro crews have been working around the clock since Wednesday to restore power and fix damaged wires. But emergency crews in both regions say there's been a rise in 911 calls relating to carbon monoxide poisoning. Ottawa Fire Services tweeting Friday, 11 residents from one home were transported to hospital with carbon monoxide poisoning from using a barbecue inside the house. In Quebec, at least 82 people have been hospitalized and one person is dead after being exposed to the odorless gas. Experts urging people to be careful when trying to keep warm. It's colorless, tasteless, it's invisible, you can't smell it, uh, but it is a poison and, and it is deadly. And any of those appliances like barbecues or generators are meant to be used only outside, not in your home. Here in Ottawa, recovery efforts continue. Bundled in layers, Charlene Nixon is hoping power will be up and running soon. The temperature inside the house is five degrees. I had driven around the neighborhood earlier today and I didn't see any trucks. Until then, I've got a wool blanket and a comforter and a duvet on top of all of that. It's the only way to keep warm. In Quebec tonight, energy officials say they fixed some of the hardest hit areas across the province, but there's still more than 100,000 still in the dark come Monday. Sandy. Jackie, thank you. Among the hardest hit areas is Montreal, and now concern is growing for vulnerable residents like seniors in care homes. Hydro-Quebec says they are a priority, but as CTV's Olivia O'Malley reports, frustration is at the boiling point. A firefighter carry is the only way Rosemary Aviles can get to the hospital. She's more than 24 hours late to her mandatory dialysis. I feel helpless, basically, uh, and frustrated that no one could do anything. The 85-year-old has been stuck inside her long-term care home, powerless since Wednesday. There is no working elevator, and staff are not allowed to carry her downstairs. So they called 911. There's no contingency plan of bringing patients down from the third floor or second floor to further medical, regular medical uh, treatments that they might have to do at the hospital. This senior home isn't the only one without power in Montreal. On Hydro-Quebec service priority list, care homes fall behind hospitals. However, Hydro-Quebec says care homes are a priority. 
Uh, the priority is higher than for, say, a residential nor nor normal home, and uh, we're working very hard uh, to restore those kind of priority as fast as possible. Hydro-Quebec reassuring customers today that it's working to restore services, but frustrations are mounting as hundreds of thousands are still in the dark and could be waiting until Monday, including seniors who say they feel like they've been forgotten. Olivia O'Malley, CTV News, Montreal. Now, British Columbia is also bracing for the possibility of power outages combined with flooding tonight as a pair of weather systems bring high winds and heavy rain. Yeah. Precipitation began falling this afternoon, but is forecasted to become more severe overnight. Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley are expected to receive 20 to 50 millimetres, while Vancouver Island could see as much as 80 millimetres of rain. Now, a Canadian delegation will be in the eye of the storm heading to Taiwan just as tensions ramp up in the region. China is conducting war games, today launching military drills off the island it regards as a renegade province. The exercises are in response to talks between Taipei and the West. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver has our report. The Chinese military kicked into high gear Saturday, deploying dozens of fighter jets and warships for three days of exercises in the Taiwan Strait that China says should serve as a stern warning to Taiwan's government. China is determined to react every time they see Taiwan stepping out of, as they would see it, stepping out of line, or they see, as they call it, foreign interference. The show of military might considered retaliation for a meeting between Taiwan's president and the U.S. House Speaker in California this week and a meeting today in Taiwan with another senior U.S. representative. Taiwan's strength, openness and resiliency is the envy of communist China. Taiwan sees itself as a sovereign state, but China considers it a breakaway province and insists the island nation will be reunified with the mainland. China has gotten more aggressive recently and today sent more than 40 jets across the median line of the Taiwan Strait, an unofficial buffer between the two. China in particular is attaching tremendous importance to any presence by Western democracies in Taiwan. They take it uh, increasingly as a sign of hostility. Soon a bipartisan delegation of Canadian MPs will be in Taiwan as a show of solidarity. There's also a lot of benefits to our MPs talking to their counterparts in Taiwan about how to counter Chinese foreign influence and foreign interference. An emerging Canadian political issue that Taiwan's representative is familiar with. The level is different. What is happening in Canada, of course, is happening in Taiwan on a daily basis. Canada and Taiwan do not have formal diplomatic relations, but the two nations agreed several months ago to begin talks on a trade deal, a topic, Sandy, likely to come up during the parliamentary visit. Annie, thank you. Emotional reunions today in Kyiv after a successful rescue operation by a humanitarian organization. 30 Ukrainian children kidnapped by Russian forces returned home. <laughs> The children from the Kherson and Kharkiv regions were reunited with their families after spending months in Russia or Russian-occupied territories. Ukraine believes at least 20,000 children have been abducted by Moscow since February 2022. An escalation of violence in the Middle East today as three rockets launched from southern Syria rained down on Israel. A rare attack from the north and coming after weeks of heightened tensions between Palestinians and Israelis. The country's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also coming under attack for his politics. <laughs> Tens of thousands took to the streets of Tel Aviv Saturday in another show of defiance over government plans to weaken the Supreme Court and revamp the country's judiciary. Well, a judicial decision late Friday in Texas to limit access to an abortion pill has launched a new front in the ongoing battle over abortion rights. Today, protests around the United States in response. This is a huge attack on the right of women. This is an assault on basic reproductive rights. The Biden administration plans to fight the ruling, setting up a legal showdown less than a year after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. The abortion drug is still available in the short term.
Well, the U.S. is also battling a deadly outbreak of avian flu that has affected millions of birds. In Canada, there are currently more than 1,700 positive cases of the H5N1 influenza in the bird population. While transmission to humans is rare, the seasonal return of Canada geese has some municipalities on high alert for their pet population. CTV's Heather Wright explains. A sign of spring as birds return to the north. But in the midst of a global avian flu outbreak, it's also a reason for caution. Because we get birds moving this time of year, it creates some added risks. We're getting birds coming up from areas where there might be more flu activity. In Ontario, several municipalities are warning residents to be vigilant, saying a significant number of birds have died or been found infected with avian flu. Can you get Pet owners are also being reminded to keep dogs on leashes and cats indoors after a dog died last week. It had been found chewing on an infected bird. It's a little bit concerning, of course. Uh, I think dog owners should be vigilant on where their dogs are going. It is rare for animals to be infected with avian flu. It's the first and only case so far in Canada of a pet dog contracting the virus. But last month, several dead skunks in Vancouver tested positive, and the virus has been found in other animals. The good news, this virus is a long way off from being able to spread effectively in mammals or in people. A lot of things would have to happen to it for it to be a pandemic virus. The current avian flu outbreak known as H5N1 has killed a record number of birds around the world. Infection in mammals seems to primarily happen through close contact with a sick bird. But the more the virus transmits, the more opportunity it has to mutate something researchers are watching closely. This virus, in terms of its uh, capacity for causing disease and potentially causing death, is not even comparable to SARS-CoV-2, which led to COVID-19. Case fatality rate for this virus would be much higher. Cases of human infection are extremely rare. Last month, Chile reported a case, but there is no known human-to-human -human transmission. Still, vaccine makers are developing new shots as a precaution. Sandy. Heather, thank you. Iran is threatening to prosecute women who defy the country's dress code. And soon there will be eyes everywhere, cameras and public places to intimidate them even more. <laughs> Women have been shunning the hijab since nationwide protests following the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody. She was detained for failing to cover her hair. Demonstrations across France over a controversial pension reform bill have sparked violent clashes between protesters and police. As CTV's Vanessa Lee reports, the confrontations are deterring tourists from visiting the nation's capital. Spring is typically a great time to visit Paris, but tourists are discovering not-so-romantic moments in the City of Light. We were a bit nervous about the protests with having little ones walking around in Paris. Since January, Paris has been the scene of strikes and protests over pension reform, which has sparked anger across the country, and in some instances, violence. The government insists it must raise the retirement age from 62 to 64 for most workers to balance the pension budget in years to come, while unions argue the money can be found elsewhere. In a city whose bread and butter is tourism, those in the hospitality sector are doing their best to reassure guests watching from abroad. Yes, we have a couple of calls and people just want to be uh, secure and, uh, and uh, be safe when they come to Paris, right? So when they call us, we say that there is uh, nothing really special. You know, life is still going on in Paris. The unrest is hard to ignore. The union representing garbage workers has announced another rolling strike is set to begin just as piles of uncollected trash were finally disappearing from the streets of the capital. From public transit to museums, there have also been sudden disruptions. The famous Louvre Museum was shut down one day when dozens of employees joined the strikes, blocking the entrance. These newlyweds say they feel lucky their trip has gone as planned. We haven't felt anything but safe, I don't yeah. think, since we've been here. Yeah, it's been nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> didn't want to have to cancel it. The new unpopular law isn't in force yet. Unions vow to continue demonstrations until the government backs down. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal.
Coming up, the struggle to find shelter. It's not safe for the community. It's not safe for the people that are living in it. Concerns and questions what to do with BC's growing encampments. Plus, the learning curve where nature meets nurture. Three days after Vancouver police and city workers dismantled tents in the downtown east side and tossed away items belonging to the unhoused, those who were displaced were back again setting up makeshift shelters. The crackdown on what officials consider dangerous encampments is now spreading across B.C. CTV's Michelle Brunoro reports. It would be hard to drive through Abbotsford and not notice the growing number of homeless, some living in tents right next to Highway 1. Others have been camped at park and rides and rest stops for years. But it's the Lonzo camp filled with rundown trailers and burned out RVs on provincially owned land that is the largest and most worrisome. The Lonzo camp in, in particular uh, is not safe. It's not safe for the community. It's not safe for the people that are living in it. We've got a number of encampments on, on Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure land. And um, it's, there's no easy answers. There's no easy one solution to any of this. The mayor estimates there are about 500 homeless people in his city, up more than 50% from just a few years ago. The number of calls to Abbotsford Fire Rescue from people experiencing homelessness has jumped dramatically. In 2019, there were about 390 calls. Last year, that number jumped to almost 2,200. Fire rescue was called to the Lonzo Camp area 484 times last year at an estimated cost of $242,000. Some of those would be overdose calls, others for fires inside homeless shelters. And police were called to this area more than 100 times in 2022 for violent crimes. When asked if the province would shut down Lonzo Camp, BC's housing minister instead promised announcements were coming. We do believe we're close to having a path forward to address the encampment. We are going to need some of the space that those encampments are in for housing. I am optimistic that there are solutions coming. Um, having said that, uh, it is a very delicate situation. And there is some hope in this camp. The couple who have lived inside this RV for two years say they have an appointment next week where they expect to get offered housing. Michelle Brunoro, CTV News, Abbotsford. Still ahead, a novel way to teach the young lessons on life with schooling that goes beyond the classroom. The prestigious Masters Golf Tournament in Georgia had a second day of nasty weather batter the course. <laughs> Heavy rain forced the third round to be suspended. Fans under a sea of umbrellas scrambled to leave. It certainly wasn't as bad as Friday when three giant pine trees pummeled by rain and heavy winds came crashing down, just barely missing spectators. The field will have a long Sunday slog as a result, packing in two rounds to determine who wears the green jacket under a promising forecast. Well, there's renewed interest for an old way of learning. Preschoolers getting an education in the great outdoors where lessons through nature are number one. CTV's Danielle Hamamjan on the forest schools of Sweden. In nurseries around the world, children are singing about stars, black sheep, and little lambs. And while it may likely be true of these two and three year olds, today's trek in the woods is more than just about fresh air and sing alongs. This is a forest school in Sweden where, naturally, Preschoolers are taught not to play with fire. But here, they're also taught how to start one. For the past six weeks, they've been learning as much as their little brains can grasp. It's easier to see how a fire works and how to light a fire uh, and to talk about what you need to light a fire. You need the heat, you need the materials, you need the oxygen. Forest schools are increasingly popular. This one here has a waiting list of 300 students. 
The fire makes the pancake possible and counting food makes math a bit more interesting. Experts say in this kind of environment, the cortisol, the stress hormone, goes down and the serotonin level goes up, so does their concentration. I, I say we, we need to have a paradigm shift in the brain about thinking about learning. What is learning about? What is teaching about? It's not only to sit in nine years in a classroom. The children are taught how to take responsibility for themselves and their friends. To work a lot of taking care of each other because that's the same thing if you want to take care of something you like you take care of your friends and we believe that if you if you take care of each other it's it's a much better place to be for all of us the life lessons will continue later in the day but for now it's nap time daniel hamamjin ctv news london great idea after the break, a little bit of fine-tuning as a tenacious teen takes aim at a gold medal. We leave you tonight with an Alberta teenager whose accuracy and aim in archery is drawing attention. And as CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier tells us, Anna Kim isn't just gifted at hitting the bullseye, she's also legally blind. It's clear this is the form and focus of an elite archer. What's not as easy to see is what Anna Kim has overcome. Being legally blind, it was something that I struggled with from, a, from an early age is fitting in. Kim has no vision in her left eye and limited vision in her right eye. She first picked up a bow at a specialized summer camp when she was nine. They looked at us, said, let's give a bunch of projectiles to those who are visually impaired and see where it goes. And I hit the target for the first time and I fell in love. She came back and said, I found my passion. I found my sport. Now 18, she started competitive archery a year and a half ago, joining this high school team in the Edmonton area. And despite the challenge posed by her limited vision, She's done amazingly well. You got one ten and four nines. So. Consistent. Her coach plays a role, watching her arrow and showing her where it landed on a much closer version of the target. Then she makes tiny adjustments to her form to get closer and closer to the center. She knows by her body um, uh, position and reflection when she shoots each arrow uh, where where her body position needs to be to shoot the next arrow. Anna is so good, she's been named to an all-star Canadian team heading to South Africa this summer to compete internationally against teens with regular vision. I see it as an honor and it's, all they can say is it's amazing and I'm terrified. She's confident, she knows what she's doing. I know she's gonna, she's gonna do not just us proud, but she'll do Canada proud. Her positive attitude and determination now taking her places she never dreamed and reminding others even a goal that seems out of reach is worth a shot. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. That's our newscast for this Saturday. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. John Venavalli Ra will be here tomorrow. Have a good night and a safe and happy Easter.